We're beginning now a unit in our course in which we're going to explore the voices and the literature uh, for marginalized people in the 19th century. That category is going to include women writers in the 19th century, Native American writers in the 19th century, and the men and women uh, who were enslaved in the 19th century. This is an important component of an American literature course because while individuals like Emerson and Thoreau and Whitman and Hawthorne and Poe and Melville, all important authors to be sure, but also all white male authors uh, have traditionally held the center of the American literary canon in, canon in the 19th century. Uh, they are surrounded uh, by a context of a variety of writers who are engaged in important contributions to American literature. In fact, uh, it's somewhat ironic uh, if you look at who was actually being read in the 19th century versus who is studied today as emblematic of American literature in the 19th century. Often it's popular writers, uh, such as Lydia Child, who are among the most popular uh, individuals uh, writing in the 19th century. Uh, and yet, you know, someone like Herman Melville, who struggles to sell uh, copies of Moby Dick goes down in history as the great American author, uh, the author of the great American novel of the 19th century. So this is an opportunity in our course to shift away from the people who traditionally hold center stage in the American canon and to explore the voices and contributions of other individuals. This will also allow us to continue to work on our exploration of American history. I've made the argument multiple times in this course, it's difficult to separate the literature that's being produced from the history in which it's being produced. That to understand and appreciate contributions from someone like uh, Lydia Child, it's important to understand what the role of women uh, was in the 19th century and what exactly Child is writing up against, or to appreciate the uh, rhetorical uh, power of Native American activism in the 19th century, it's important to understand exactly what policies were being implemented against them. Uh, and so we're going to start with an exploration on women in the 19th century. Uh, we will also talk specifically about one woman writer from the 19th century in a separate recording, and that'll be Emily Dickinson. And then we're going to talk about Native American rhetoric and resistance before turning to a discussion of uh, antebellum black literature, specifically in the genre of the slave narrative. But first, let's talk about women in the 19th century. So a lot of the situation that uh, women find themselves in in the 19th century is driven in large part by the doctrine of coverture. The social conditions for women in the United States really didn't change that much after the American Revolution. Although the Constitution did not specifically prohibit a role for women, in a government, uh, it did exclude women by virtue of the fact that only people who owned land were going to be able to vote and women were simply not able to own things themselves. The doctrine of coverture states that the husband in a marriage has legal authority over the person, the property, and the choices of his wife. That doctrine remained in place as the United States became a nation at the end of the 18th century and continued growing into the 19th century. We previously discussed the ways that the age of Andrew Jackson led to an expansion of democracy in America. The property owning uh, provisions were uh, removed from being able to get access to the ballot box, 
but voting was still restricted to white men over the age of 21. So women were excluded from the political processes as well. What then in, turned out to be the role of women in the 19th century before the Civil War? Well, a few things turned out to be um, of shaping forces on the lives of women in America during that time. The first is the idea I, that I have up here on the board of Republican motherhood. It's capitalized for the sake of being up on the board, but this is not Republican in the sense of a, the Republican Party uh, that we might think of, uh, but Republican as the adjective to describe being a mother in the American Republic. The idea of Republican motherhood was that the role of women uh, was to be in the home teaching and guiding a new generation of men. Essentially, the woman's place was inside the home raising male children who would grow up to become adults who would become the next generation of leaders. It was seen as a contribution to the overall structure of the government and society at large. This was, of course, very limiting, right? I'm not going to make any sort of claim to, to the contrary, uh, but it did have the advantage of one thing, which was it began to equate women with uh, opportunities for teaching. Uh, and that did give women some access to education at this time although not enough access to education at this time. Women were still excluded from institutions of higher education, and that limited their potential to you know, uh, become uh, equal uh, members within uh, the workforce or within uh, society overall. Uh, you see a lot of advocacy at the end of the 18th century into the start of the 19th century trying to encourage uh, the ability for women to gain greater access to education. We saw this when we considered Judith Sargent Murray's On the Equality of the Sexes. Remember, the thesis inside that essay is about giving men and women equal access to education. Across the Atlantic in Britain, uh, Mary Wollstonecraft uh, is writing uh, a vindication of the rights of women, which is also putting forward the idea that women need access, greater access to education and to paid employment. Because if women are exclusively dependent on men for financial support, that's going to continue and perpetuate a cycle in which women within the structure of a society remain uh, subordinate or subjugated to men. As the market economy grew in the early part of the 19th century in America, uh, we see many people starting to leave the home to go to work outside the home. This at first provides an opportunity uh, for some women mostly lower class or lower middle class women to leave the home and be able to get employment. Uh, and one would think that perhaps because money is often tied to education and privilege and liberty, that upper middle class or upper class women as the market economy emerged would also gain access to being able to step outside the home and uh, find employment. But that turns out not to be the case. What arises during this time has been termed by historians as the cult of domesticity. This is the idea that, um, that you're probably familiar with in, in some shape or form of the man leaving the home to go to a place of employment to earn money to support the family and woman as mother and homemaker. Uh, somebody who stays behind. As part of the cult of domesticity, we have a number of uh, stereotypical and destructive cultural cliches that start to emerge during this time. 
uh, such as the woman's place being in the home women possessing what are called non-market values, things like love and friendship and mutual ob obligation. So that a man would go to work, and of course work might be difficult, or work might be challenging, or work might stress him out, but when he comes home, he's supposed to be received by a wife who's going to take care of him and make him feel better. This is also a time in which we start to see the idea of virtue being associated with womanhood. A sense of sexual virtuousness, of course, sexual innocence, uh, sort of tied in with the idea of virtue, but also this sense of women as beautiful, women as frail, women as entirely dependent on men. During this time, as American culture began to embrace more and more freedom, uh, the definition of where freedom came from began to be associated more with what were seen as inborn qualities. So men were seen as aggressive, men were seen as domineering, men were able to be seen as able to sustain and defend uh, freedom. Whereas women became more associated with the freedom to practice nurture, the freedom to practice selflessness, a domestic role emerging during this time. Interestingly though, although the workforce, the economy, jobs with salaries were increasingly uh, not going to women, or women were not gaining access to those jobs. Many women who were part of middle class and upper middle class or upper class uh, families uh, were able to start trying to find other things to do with their time, right? If you don't have the opportunity to uh, go out and have a job and make something of yourself, right? Humans have a natural desire to have some sort of purpose right? Something to do that they can master, to accomplish, to feel like they're making a difference. This is something that all people have. And we see a rise in the 19th century of women who are financially stable, who decide to start taking part in reform movements. Obviously, the reform movements that are drawing a lot of the most attention during this time include anti-slavery movements, right? Also advocacy for the rights of Native Americans. And the temperance movement or an anti-alcohol movement. It's important to understand that the role of women in reform movements sort of on the one hand mirrors and reflects back uh, the inverse of what's going on with men. So at this time, of course, the realm of government and the realm of politics, the realm of, of running the state and being in control of the state is seen as the uh, responsibility and the opportunity for men. There's this idea that politics is too rough for women, that uh, that government is too brutal and too, there too much moral compromises are necessary in order to effectively govern, right? And that sort of stereotype and that um, misogynistic and sexist perspective shuts women out of the government and, and the governing processes and the realm of politics. But reform movements open themselves up and women not necessarily taking a role as elected officers of the government are nevertheless taking on responsibilities that are starting to shape the appearance of the culture and the policy that's debated and discussed within the culture. Women's letters and diaries during this time uh, reveal that they have a keen interest in political issues, even though they did not have the right to vote. 
uh, they were organizing, they were circulating petitions, they were lobbying political bodies like state legislatures and at activist groups. They were attending mass meetings, they were participating in parades, they were delivering public lectures, and they were raising money for political causes. All under the realm of the reform movement. Now, this work that's getting done with the anti-slavery movement and advocacy for Native Americans and the temperance movement has a really interesting effect. Notice what I don't have on this list at first is a women's rights movement. Women become involved first in reform movements that are directed outside themselves in the 19th century. But as they take part in these movements, they begin to see what undoubtedly became uncomfortable parallels. Okay. Uh, and we have, for the first time, rhetoric entering into the American conversation that begins to see women as subjugated in the same way that enslaved people and Native Americans are. The temperance movement is not just an anti alcohol movement, right? But the idea behind the temperance movement at first is that it's designed to clean up society, right? It's a public health issue. Drunkenness at this time is really a public health crisis. And connected to a temperance movement is also a concern about what alcohol can do for domestic abuse. Right? Men who go to the pubs and they get drunk and they come home and they engage in domestic abuse against women who don't have any legal protections and against children who don't have any legal protections is part of a motivating cause to be involved in the temperance movement. Right? Sometimes I think we have a tendency to dismiss the temperance movement as you know just people who didn't want people to have a good time, an anti-alcohol movement because alcohol was seen as um, perhaps not uh, uh, seen as a drug, an intoxicant, anti-Christian ideas. And certainly there's an element of that to the temperance movement. But there are also people who are involved in the temperance movement who see um, that uh, uh, reducing the effects of alcohol in a society is also going to be something that's overall good for women and children. So in time, the work that's done in these movements starts to open up this idea that women too are being subjected uh, to the control of another force and subjugated into a role of second class citizenship. So eventually we have the emergence here of women's rights as part of the goal of the reform movements. Now, what I uh, can't stress enough is that once these reform movements begin to focus too on the role of women's rights, that's when the reform movements start to experience a variety of stress. Not every person involved in these reform movements was comfortable with the idea of women taking part in the reform movements. In fact, one of the great internal battles of the abolition movement in the years leading up to the Civil War is whether women should have been involved. And uh, an individual like Elizabeth Cady Stanton, whose Declaration of Sentiments we read uh, to go along with this discussion, is a key figure in um, uh, advocating for women to have uh, the ability to take part in the abolition movement. Right? Frederick Douglass famously says, when the true history of the anti-slavery cause shall be written, women will occupy a large space in its pages. It should also be known uh, or recognized, at least as part of this introduction to our discussion, that it is not just men 
who are uncomfortable with women playing a large role in reform movements, but it's also women who are uncomfortable with some women playing a role in reform movements. Some uh, women saw it as unbecoming of women to be active and protesting and raising money and politicking and all of these sorts of things, and that leads to tensions as well. Uh, I had asked you to look at some texts from important female figures uh, in the early 19th century for American literature, and I want to run through uh, the first two together, and then we're going to turn to the Declaration of Sentiments from Elizabeth Cady Stanton and talk a little bit about the Seneca Falls Convention of 1848, which is a pivotal moment in American history, and particularly the history of women's rights in America. So I ask you to take a look at uh, a prose writer and a poet. We'll start with the poet. Uh, Lydia Howard Huntley Sigourney uh, is the poet who I ask you to take a look at. Uh, she's born in 1791, so in terms of our course, she's the uh, person born closest to the start of America, you know, post-Constitution, uh, 1789. She is the most popular woman poet of the early national and the antebellum period. Uh, she uh, writes many other things as well, not just poetry, but her poetry is part of really what makes her famous. She has a strong anti-slavery approach to her politics, as you no doubt saw in the poetry, uh, the poems that I assigned for you. She said that she wrote out of a, quote, womanly duty with the hope of, quote, becoming an instrument of good. And there is a lot of that during the time, that sense that that if you can speak, if you have the privilege to speak, you have the obligation to speak. The obligation to make your voice heard so that people can hear and perhaps grow and change. I ask you to, to take a look at four poems from Sigourney, uh, To the First Slave Ship, Indian Names, Slavery, and Fallen Forests. And I think you can get a sense from uh, these four poems of uh, what were the concerns, the political concerns that Sigourney had, right? She's obviously involved in the anti-slavery movement. She is a, an advocate for the rights of Native Americans, or at least a critic for, of the way that the government is treating Native Americans. And in Fallen Forests, you can see that she also has an environmental concern to her. Uh, the poems are traditional in their structure and their form, right? Uh, they're metered. They have uh, um, three of the um, uh, four poems that I ask you to read have rhyme. Uh, consider to the first slave ship. This uh, presents itself as an ode, right? A poem addressed to something, usually uh, not a person, uh, but an ode to an object, right? And sometimes it has the idea of uh, vaunting up the object, uh, making it sort of greater than life. But Sigourney uses this idea and she uses it to criticize or to uh, reflect on the first uh, slave ship arriving in America, not knowing the horror and the nightmare that it is about to unleash on American culture. First of that train which cursed the wave and from the rifled cabin bore inheritor of woe, the slave to bless his palm tree's shade no more, dire engine or the troubled mane, born on in unresisted state, knowest thou within thy dark domain the secrets of thy prisoned freight. Hearest 
thou their moans, whom hope hath fled? Wild cries and agonizing starts. Knowest thou thy humid sails are spread with ceaseless sighs from broken hearts? The fettered chieftain's burning tear, the parted lover's mute despair, the childless mother's pang severe, the orphan's misery are there. Ah, couldst thou from the scroll of fate the annal read of future years, stripes, tortures, unrelenting hate, and death gasps drowned in slavery's tears. The poem ends in a complicated way, I think, the last four stanzas read as follows. Poor outcast slave, our guilty land should tremble while she drinks thy tears, or sees in vengeful silence stand the beacon of thy shortened years. Should shrink to hear her sons proclaim the sacred truth that heaven is just, shrink even at her judge's name, Jehovah, savior of the oppressed. The sun upon thy forehead frowned, but man more cruel far than he. Dark fetters of thy spirit bound, look to the mansions of the free. Look to that realm where chains unbind, where the pale tyrant drops his rod, and where the patient sufferers find a friend, a father in their God. There is a sense at the end of the poem or an implication that the only possibility of release, the only possibility of freedom that is going to exist for enslaved individuals at the time that the poem is produced in the late 1820s is death. Now, one could look at that and, and say that perhaps that's a, a, a very narrow imagination, right? Uh, there are certainly people at this time who are petitioning and engaged in abolitionist causes, uh, though it hasn't heated up to the degree that it's going to in the years that are going to immediately precede the Civil War. Um, and so is this a lack of imagination on Sigourney's part, or is this, in fact, perhaps a sort of brutal realism or pragmatism? that at this time slavery seemed so entrenched in American culture that there, there felt, it felt like there was no way out uh, for the pain and the suffering and the agony um, except death. But then again, if that's the case, then the poem itself loses sort of its political ambitions too because it should be the essence of this poem to imagine a world in which slavery can be done away with. The, the guilty land can be made pure um, through the abolition of the institution as opposed to the land itself simply soaking in the tears of the people who are being subjugated and in pain. The poem Indian Names is uh, a clever and, and heartbreaking poem, I think, um, in which uh, Sigourney wonders, you know, how is it possible that we seem to forget um, everything associated with the Native Americans when the names that they use are all over the place, right? From state names to river names to lake names to city names to... Um, uh, uh, mountain names, uh, so much of the language is drawn from the Native American language and everything around is, is named uh, for them and yet they themselves are being pushed off of the land that uh, the names remain on. Is a uh, uh, sad uh, plight that Sigourney is bringing to the surface and pointing out the sort of cruel irony and cruel hypocrisy. 
Um, you know, there used to be a joke that what, what the suburbs are the places where they tear down all the trees and then they name the streets after the trees. You know, Oak Street, Maple Street, you know, so on and so forth. And that is kind of uh, part of what, what Sigourney is after in a poem like Indian Names. Ye say they have all, they all have passed away, that noble race and brave, that their light canoes have vanished from off the crested wave, that mid the forest where they roamed, there rings no hunter's shout, but their name is on your waters. Ye may not wash it out. So, oh, they're not here anymore, they're, you know, they're going elsewhere, um, but we can't hide in Sigourney's poetic imagination here, we can't hide from the sin that has occurred, the crime that has been committed. Uh, Fallen Forests is a poem uh, that is uh, in blank verse, um, and it is a, a very ecological poem poem. Um, and the, the imagery and the language that accompanies uh, the poem here is, is, is beautiful and staggering at the same time. Just look at the introduction to Fallen Forests. Man's warfare on the trees is terrible. He lifts his rude hut in the wilderness, and lo, the loftiest trunks that age on age were nurtured to nobility and bore their summer coronets so gloriously, fall with a thunder sound to rise no more. He toucheth flame unto them, and they lie a blackened wreck, their tracery and wealth of sky-fed emerald madly spent to feed an arch of brilliance for a single night, and searing thence the wild deer and the fox and the lithe squirrel from the nut-strewn holm so enjoyed. He lifts his puny arm, and every echo of the axe doth hew the iron heart of centuries away. It's powerful language uh, and startling and melancholy all at the same time. To me, the, my favorite word in the passage that I just read to you is puny, right? He lifts his puny arm. You know, mankind lifts his puny arm to cut down the tree, but every echo of the ax is felt centuries away. Beautiful, glorious, and, and sad image. I also ask you to take a look at uh, Lydia Child's essay on women's rights. It's on page 155 in your anthology. Uh, Child was a highly successful journalist in her time. One of the most widely read writers of the 19th century, actually. Uh, William Lloyd Garrison, the famed abolitionist and newspaper editor, called her the first woman of the Republic, right? Um, she helped uh, uh, blaze a trail for female journalists in the era before the Civil War. And uh, these letters from New York, the letter that I ask you to take a look at, uh, 34, concerns women's rights. Now let's, let's close in for a second on something that uh, Child is talking about that I think is um, uh, so insightful, but also I would say uh, something that we still really struggle with here in the 21st century, let alone the early 19th century. This is on page 155. She shares a quote from the English essayist William Hazlitt, and Hazlitt says, um, it is not easy to keep up a conversation with women in company. It is thought a piece of rudeness to differ from them. It is not quite fair to ask them a reason for what they say. She's taking this quote from Hazlitt and she's going to reflect on it. Um, but her point here is that when an act is done, by a repressing group onto a subjugated group, that 
often the repressing group will cloak its subjugation in a rhetoric or in a conceit of politeness, right? But the idea of, oh, politics and the business world, these are rough and tumble places. This is no place for a woman, right? That's, what, that's the kind of rhetoric that child is objecting to here, right? That's the kind of rhetoric that just, you can tell by the way she writes, it just gets under her skin and she, she cannot even bear it. Because what she finds in that is a, such an insidious idea, right? I'm going to protect you by sub, subjecting you to my will by subjugating you and preventing you from being able to take part in the process. Here's what she says on page 155 of our anthology, the Norton Anthology of American Literature, volume B, 10th edition. This sort of politeness to women is what men call gallantry, an odious word to every sensible woman because she sees that it is merely the flimsy veil which foppery throws over sensuality to conceal its grossness. So far is it from indicating sincere esteem and affection for women that the profligacy of a nation may in general may be fairly measured by its gallantry. Right? So what she's saying here is that it uses the rhetoric of, of esteeming or respecting or having an affection for something, but it is so far from that. It's infantilizing, it's demoralizing, it's robbing people of agency and independence. Right? And she says this often is the way that it happens a rhetoric of esteem and affection is hardly ever sincere. It's just masking over the sexism and the misogyny. This taking away rights and condescending to grant privileges is an old trick of the physical force principle. And with the immense majority who only look on the surface of things, this mask effectively disguises an ugliness which would otherwise be abhorred. The most inveterate slaveholders are probably those who take most pride in dressing their household servants handsomely and who would be most ashamed to have the name of being unnecessarily cruel. And profligates who form the lowest and most sensual estimate of women are the very ones to treat them with an excess of outward deference. So whenever you see somebody, she says, who seems like they're, uh, they are, they're being overtly deferential, to a woman. She says, that's really masking the fact that they don't hold women in high esteem, but that it appears that way culturally. There are a few books which I can read through. I mean, first of all, this paragraph, uh, it, <laughs> there, there are still people on the internet who are talking about this paragraph in some way, shape, or form in the way that men write women in literature. Okay, so I'm just gonna draw attention to that before I read the paragraph. There are a few books which I can read through without feeling insulted as a woman. But this insult is almost universally conveyed through that which was intended for praise. Right, she says, the way that men write women is that they're, they're praising them, but in doing so, all they're doing is insulting them. Just imagine for a moment what impression it would make on men if women authors should write about their rosy lips and melting eyes and voluptuous forms as they write about us. That women in general do not feel this kind of flattery to be an insult, I readily admit. 
right? So she says she understands that, she, that there are many people out there who don't find this language insulting, right? But she does. For in the first place, they do not perceive the gross chattel principle of which it is the utterance. Moreover, they have from long habit become accustomed to consider themselves as household conveniences or gilded toys. Hence, they consider it feminine and pretty to abjure all such use of their faculties as would make them co-workers with man in the advancement of those great principles on which the progress of society depends. And then she quotes here Hannah Moore, an English evangelical writer, there is perhaps no animal so much indebted to subordination for its good behavior as woman. So she's pointing out that there are lots of people who embrace this um, because that's what they're used to or because they think that it's um, a, a, a flattering thing, but she's trying to draw attention to the fact that what it does is it is actually making it more difficult for women to gain a foothold in society and to be considered equal participants on improving society and advancing the culture because instead the emphasis is on how they look, how pretty they are, their appearances, and not on the value of their mind and their emphasis on their ability to contribute to the overall uh, process of making the society better. That's a good transition for us to talk uh, here about the Seneca Falls Convention. Uh, so the Seneca Falls Convention is organized by Elizabeth Cady Stanton and also uh, Lucretia Mott. Uh, they're two anti-slavery activists. They had met in London. Stanton herself was in London. Uh, she and her husband were on a honeymoon in London, uh, and they were going to attend the World Anti-Slavery Convention. Uh, but she was barred from entering the convention because she was a woman. Uh, Lucretia Mott was also in London for the convention, and of course, also barred from entering the convention, and the two of them together uh, shared this resentment on the way that the abolition movement was treating women. They came home, and in upstate New York, in Seneca Falls, in 1848, they hosted the Seneca Falls Convention, where abolitionists and preachers and transcendental writers, uh, Quaker activists, those who participated in the Underground Railroad, so on and so forth, came together to discuss uh, a series of re uh, resolutions on the rights of women. The primary text at the Seneca Falls Convention was called the Declaration of Sentiments. Uh, and the Declaration of Sentiments is, uh, as you no doubt know from reading it, modeled on the Declaration of Independence. You can hear it in the name, right? Declaration of Sentiments, Declaration of Independence. This is on page six, 672 of your anthology. Stanton does something really brilliant. She takes the Declaration of Independence and she twists what it's trying to do and removes from Declaration of Independence the he, meaning King George III, uh, and the stand-in for the British government more generally, and she makes the he of the Declaration of Independence men. She situates women in the position of the colonists who are writing the Declaration of Independence. And she uses the same structure and same rhetorical approach that Jefferson uses to highlight the fact that women are being uh, as subjected 
or more so in many ways, than the way that the British government was subjecting the American colonists. There are numerous passages in the document that literally just lift wholesale paragraphs from Jefferson with just minor tweaks, right? Consider the opening paragraph. When in the course of human events, it becomes necessary for one portion of the family of man to assume among the people of the earth a position different from that which they have hitherto occupied, but one to which the laws of nature and, the, and of nature's God entitle them, a decent respect to the opinions of mankind requires that they should declare the causes that impel them to such a course. That's very similar to the opening paragraph to the Declaration of Independence. But the next paragraph is literally lifting the passage from Jefferson with one important change. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men and women are created equal. And then the paragraph continues, right? Uh, that they are going to uh, insist upon the institution of government laying its foundation on these principles and developing them. Now, when she gets into the enumeration of abuses that Jefferson used in the Declaration of Independence to lay the groundwork for why revolution uh, uh, and a breaking free of Britain is justified, Again, she uses that structure of the he-driven paragraphs, right? He has done this, he has done this, he has done this, except now the he is in reference to men in general, right? She says, the history of mankind is a history of repeated injuries and usurpations on the part of man toward woman, having in direct object the establishment of an absolute tyranny over her, right? This language is very similar to the Declaration of Independence. To prove this, let facts be submitted to a candid world. He has never permitted her to exercise her inalienable right to the elective franchise. Right? Women can't vote. He has compelled her to submit to laws in the formation of which she had no voice. Not only that she's not a representative of the government, but she hasn't been able to vote for the government, and the government is writing the laws that is subjecting her. He has withheld from her rights, which are given to the most ignorant and degraded men, both natives and foreigners. And this sentence is a reminder that one of the driving forces of the women's rights movement during this time Although they are anti-slavery and they're advocating in favor of Native Americans, there's a bit of a nativist uh, bend to the rhetoric, right? That men who would not be esteemed as worthy of other men are nevertheless getting more rights than wealthy white women are able to have. And so there's a little bit of... Uh, uh, discomfort in recognizing that is part of the language and part of the work and, and it's also going to be part of I think the the shadow that gets cast over the women's movement following the Civil War there are some um, racist rhetoric around uh, the 15th Amendment which gives black men the right to vote uh, and women uh, activists will say um, that they are appalled at that before white women are given the ability to vote. It's a reality of the movement at this time, and it's also a reality, I think, you know, reflected our own contemporary culture. A lot of politics around uh, identity and the advancing of groups are often seen as zero-sum politics, right? That it's, it's either uh, I get the benefit that I'm after or I lose it at, at, for the expense of somebody else. Um, and I think that's not the way that it needs to be. It's not the way that it has to be either. 
but it is the way that often politics goes, that the advancement of one group often means another group is not able to achieve the same advancement at the same time. In the context, I pointed out the example of the 1964 Civil Rights Act, which was written to uh, allow an enforcement mechanism that was going to prevent segregation on a national level and give people access uh, to civil rights. And uh, one congressman trying to derail the Civil Rights Act because he didn't want to see uh, civil rights extended on the basis of race, he added in language that was going to protect women because the idea was that no man in Congress, even the most progressive when it came to race issues, was going to be willing to stomach the idea of granting equality and civil rights to women. Okay? So the nation, the movement through the culture of the nation itself trying to grow and expanding rights and privileges and protections to uh, different classes of individuals is often a history of uh, trying to be the group that gets the advantage first because there's a fear that if you're not that group, then you're gonna lose out. And it's not an unfounded concern, right? I mean, the women's rights movement struggles after the Civil War to make any kind of uh, headway because there's, an, there's a feeling, a general pervasive feeling among many in America that the Civil War had ushered in a new era of civil rights for black men as part of the Reconstruction Amendments uh, that happened after the Civil War and that the United States had experienced a lot of change already. And the women's rights movement struggles to gain a foothold in the second half of the 19th century as a result of that. And it's not until the early part of the 20th century, 1920 actually, that uh, the right to vote is enshrined in the Constitution for women. So this is a complicated reality that we have to uh, explore and consider um, when, we, when we see language like that in place. Uh, and think about the ways in which progressive documents uh, can also have uh, you know, regressive or darker elements to them um, in the pursuit of an overall public good, right? I think a lot of us would say the good is possible for everybody. That advancing the rights of one group doesn't necessarily mean we have to ignore the rights of another group. Um, but the reality in politics is often it doesn't work that way. And that's something that we need to ask ourselves, is it, is it ever going to be possible for us to change that? I think we can, but we'll have to ask ourselves whether it's realistic. Having deprived her of this first right of a citizen, the elective franchise, thereby leaving her without representation in the halls of legislation. He has oppressed her on all sides. He has made her, if married in the eye of the law, civilly dead. Powerful language. He has taken from her all right and property. He deprives her of her liberty. He administers chastisement. He taxes her to support a government which recognizes her only when her property can be made profitable to it. He's monopolized nearly every profitable employment. And when she's allowed employment, Stanton says here, she receives but scanty remuneration. As a teacher of theology, medicine, or law, she is not known. He has denied her the facilities of obtaining a thorough education, all colleges being closed to her. He allows her in church, but a subordinate position. He has usurped the prerogative of Jehovah himself, claiming it as his right to assign her a sphere of action when that belongs to her conscience and to her God. He has endeavored in every way that he could to destroy her confidence in her own powers, to lessen her self-respect, and to make her willing to lead a dependent abject life. Now, importantly, the provision of this acknowledges how progressive it is for its time, 
but they make a series of resolutions, right? Uh, and that's the second part of this document. And these are the resolutions that the convention voted on. That such laws as conflict in any way with the true and substantial happiness of women are contrary to the great precept of nature and of no validity. Okay? There's a resolution and the convention votes and it's unanimous <laughs> in favor of this resolution. Another resolution that woman is man's equal was intended to be so by the creator and the highest good of the race demands that she should be recognized as such, right? That's a resolution presented to the convention, passes unanimously. Another one. In so much as man, while claiming for himself intellectual superiority, does accord to women moral superiority, it is preeminently his duty to encourage her to speak and teach as she has an opportunity in all religious assemblies. Again, presented to the convention, passes unanimously. 10 out of the 11 resolutions pass unanimously. But the one resolution that does not pass unanimously, it passes, but it doesn't pass unanimously, is the resolution calling for women to have the right to vote. And there's contention within the convention that if they pass a statement like that as part of this document, people are going to dismiss it as radical. They're going to dismiss it as unrealistic and, and, and outside uh, pragmatism. It passes, but it doesn't pass unanimously. Which I think goes to show that even among a group of abolitionists, even among a group of activists and volunteers on the Underground Railroad and Unitarian ministers and transcendental writers and women in attendance, uh, you know, uh, uh, advocates and, and uh, uh, reformers in attendance, even among the people who progress them or who present themselves as the most progressive of their time, there's still a difficulty to imagine a world in which women are going to be able to have the right to vote. It's an important consideration for us to think about. And Mott's declaration of, I'm sorry, Stanton's declaration of sentiments is a powerful repurposing of Jefferson's rhetoric in the Declaration of Independence to try to prove the point about how women are marginalized and subjugated by men in the same way that the colonists were marginalized and subjugated by Britain. Or in many respects, worse than that, right? Because at least the colonists had some sort of legal protections, even if they didn't have exactly what they wanted as part of those protections. These three writers are important and they're just representative of all of the women who are doing amazing work during this time who I wish we had more time to consider and to explore. In the context, I talk a little bit about key authors in the reform era. Uh, other authors that we didn't get to included Margaret Fuller. I really recommend if you have the opportunity to read uh, the excerpts from Fuller in the uh, Norton Anthology of American Literature. Uh, and Catherine Maria Sedgwick and Fanny Fern and, uh, and others still. We'll talk about Harriet Beecher Stowe when we get to uh, resistance to slavery and the prelude to the Civil War. Um, and I wish we had more time to focus on some of the other uh, women writers in this uh, era. Uh, but we do have time to, to zoom in and focus on one in particular, and that'll be uh, Emily Dickinson. Uh, and so in the next lecture, we're going to talk about Dickinson's poems and her influence on American poetry, which in many respects is equal to or perhaps even uh, greater than the uh, uh, poetic influence uh, made by Walt Whitman.